heat waves, drought, tornadoes, hurricanes, floods, blizzards, bitter cold. Extreme weather has an incredible impact on people across the globe. On Mount Washington, our scientists brave some of the worst weather on the planet to improve our understanding of our warming world. All right, hello and good evening. Welcome everyone to Mount Washington Observatory's Science in the Mountains program sponsored by MathWorks. My name is Brian Fitzgerald and I'm the Director of Science and Education here at Mount Washington Observatory. And joining us this evening to discuss weather instrumentation used at Mount Washington Observatory are my colleagues, Keith Garrett, who's our Information Systems Administrator, and Nicole Tallman, who's joining us from the summit. She's a weather observer and education specialist. So for those of you who aren't already familiar, the Mount Washington Observatory is a nonprofit member supported organization whose mission is to advance the understanding of the forces that create Earth's weather and climate. And we accomplish that in a few different ways. Uh, for starters, we operate a summit weather station in which we measure weather and climate data with around the clock weather observation and weather forecasting. We also conduct research and product testing. And also we develop and offer innovative educational programs. If you have some questions for tonight's speakers and are joining us via Zoom, please use the Q&A button that's found at the bottom of your toolbar on your video screen. We're going to be able to co collect your questions throughout the whole program, so we'll have time at the end for a live Q&A, but make sure you get your questions in, especially as they come up. Uh, if you're joining us on the live stream on Facebook, welcome and thanks so much for being with us. While we won't be able to respond to your questions on the Facebook feed during the program, our summit staff will try and respond uh, as quickly as they can following the program. And if you'd like to connect through Zoom for the next program, make sure you register using the program link at mountwashington.org slash SITM. All righty, so we are gonna kick things off here and get it going actually by launching a poll for everyone who's on Zoom. If you'd like to participate, you should see it popping onto your screen here in just a second. We are curious, a couple, uh, for, for those of you who are returning, a couple of familiar questions and a few trivia questions as well. So we're curious, where are you joining us from this evening? Are you currently a member of Mount Washington Observatory? Don't forget, we are a nonprofit supported by membership. And also we're curious, again, here's some trivia questions. When were the first known weather observations taken in the United States? Uh, a question, this one came from Keith Garrett, who you'll hear from in just a little bit. According to Keith, what are the most challenging parts or part of running a remote weather station or network of stations? And lastly, this trivia comes from Nicole Tallman on the summit. What's the oldest continuously used instrument at the summit weather station? You have a few choices there, pedo anemometer, a sling psychrometer, barometer, a barograph, Get your guesses in now. See quite a, quite a few people participating. So that's great. Lots of great participation this evening. I'll give you just another few moments to tally some responses here and we'll see what we got. And three, two, one. All right, we'll end it there just for now. Sorry if you couldn't get your answers in, but let's see what we have. Let's share some results here. Where are you joining from this evening? Ooh, overwhelmingly all from the Northeast. But that being said, we have some pretty good representation coming from the Mid-Atlantic, the Southeast, a couple folks in the Southwest, someone out there in the Pacific Northwest, perhaps. Uh, a number of folks out there in the heartland in the Midwest. Well, oh, nobody from outside the US tonight. That's too bad. Current members of the observatory right now, yes, uh, ooh, pretty good proportions here. 47% say they're currently a member of the observatory. Quite a few of you unfortunately are not, but that means you have an opportunity to become one. And then, whoa, 13 of you said, no, I'm not, but if I'm really impressed by this program, then I'll become one. So no pressure on us, Nicole and Keith. We'll, we'll do our best job tonight to make sure we can convince you of your support. And then for trivia, one of the first known weather observations taken in the US, quite a few, few of you think 1762. 
According to Keith, one of the most challenging parts of running a remote weather station. A lot of you think all of the above. We'll have to wait and see what Keith has to say about that. And lastly, what do we think is the oldest continuously used instrument? It looks like a bear graph was the winner there. All right, we'll have to wait and see. A little Easter eggs left uh, in the presentations here for, for all of you to, uh, to find. So uh, with that being said, let's, let's kick the program off here and I will see if I can get my PowerPoint to just load right up. Wouldn't that be nice? So I will share my screen again here and bear with me one moment as I navigate through and we will launch this PowerPoint. So hopefully everyone is seeing, oh, not seeing what I wanted you to see. All right, there we go. Here we go. So like I said, tonight's program is all about weather instrumentation at the home of the world's worst weather. Uh, and to kick things off, I'll be talking about our cooperative weather station here in the Valley. Uh, next, we'll have Keith Garrett speak about our network of mesonet stations throughout the White Mountains. And then uh, last but not least, Nicole Tallman talking about instrumentation on Mount Washington. So that being said, let's take a quick visual of the North Conway Cooperative Ob Observer Station. And this one's located right in North Conway Village on Pine Street. This station is run by observatory staff and volunteers who come to the site every single day of the year at 8 a.m. to complete the once daily weather observations, which summarize both our current conditions and data from the previous 24 hours. You can see the, uh, just in that very quick snapshot, and we'll go into a little more detail here, there are definitely quite a few instruments going on, even though this is probably one of our simplest weather stations that the observatory runs. Now, I, I have to mention as well, uh, one of the misconceptions that we get uh, from uh, general members of the public is that, well, the observatory, everyone thinks of just the summit weather station. Well, we have just about almost two dozen weather stations that are operated under Mount Washington Observatory's uh, guidance. Uh, the summit, the mesonet system, as I mentioned in here at North Conway, well, this is our lowest elevation site and as part of the Cooperative Observer Program that I'll mention in just a second here. For a little background history though, Joe Dodge, the, one of the observatory's founders actually started this weather station uh, near his home uh, off of West Side Road in North Conway, for those of you familiar with the area, back in 1959 and ran the station for over a decade. Uh, pretty impressive run just for Joe, who was also helping manage the weather station on the summit and elsewhere at the same time. Uh, that was handed off to Briggs Bunker, actually one of my, my neighbors in North Conway Village here, who ran it for an impressive over 25 years, as you can see, 1974 to 2006. So uh, very close by, uh, right in the front yard of his house off of Pine Street in North Conway Village. Uh, he handed off to an observatory trustee uh, and then cooperative observer volunteer at Bergeron, who had it on his house back on West Side Road until 2015. And then uh, in 2015, uh, the station was moved under Mount Washington Observatory uh, guidance in, uh, in 2015, as I said there, and we've uh, been running it with both staff and volunteers ever since. Uh, so I, I've mentioned the Cooperative Observer Program a, a couple times here for those of you who are unfamiliar. Uh, this uh, station in particular is part of this nationwide program that's supported by the National Weather Service. Uh, this program has over 8,700 volunteers across the country. Uh, that take observations uh, all over the country, all 50 states, uh, several territories, as you can see, more than 4,300 stations across the country, which is pretty impressive. Everything from farmlands, uh, urban sites, suburban areas, national parks, seashores, mountaintops, uh, not, not including Mount Washington Observatory. Um, so great representation across the country. Uh, this program was formally created back in 1890 under the Organic Act. Uh, as you can see, two main uh, missions there to provide meteorological data, so uh, near-term weather data that helped define the U.S.'s uh, climate and long-term trends, and then also real, near real-time data is helpful for supporting forecasts, warnings, advisories that all come from the National Weather Service as well to help verify uh, data that they are ingesting as well. Uh, observations at these sites usually consist at minimum of a maximum and minimum temperature measurement, snowfall over 24 hours, including precipitation. Well, I went too far there. Uh, and uh, in addition to that, some other 
other wet weather variables measured as well, but mostly temperature and precipitation being really the key variables for helping us understand the country's long-term uh, climate and uh, near-term weather conditions as well. Uh, Co-op stations, as I mentioned, it's, even though they formally started in 1890, they can go all the way back to, and here's our first trivia answer, 1644 is uh, the earliest known weather observations that were actually taken without the benefit of standard instruments. Uh, I'm unfortunately going to butcher this gentleman's name, but we'll say it's John Holmes uh, in the territory of New Sweden in the, uh, I think the Delaware River Valley area back in 1644. But more famously, if you're a U.S. history fan, you probably knew that George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, Benjamin Franklin all maintain records. Thomas Jefferson probably the most fastidious among them. Uh, between 1776 and 1816, he took weather observations. Pretty impressive. So here's a, a quick visual tour, a little more in depth of what the co-op station looks like. And I'll, I'll pause uh, after this to kind of go through some of our instruments. Uh, this little box here houses our minimum maximum temperature sensor data logger here. So this is where uh, it was a nice balmy 72 degrees there, as you can see when I shot this video just the other day. Uh, this is the temperature sensor that is recording data and being logged into that sensor as well. Here's our standard rain gauge. You can't see the, the funnel inside, but here I am trying to hold the camera and also put our measuring stick in here. It's a pretty simple process. You just measure what falls inside the gauge with a nice ruler. It couldn't be any simpler than that. Um, so you can see there's a tube that I'm pulling outside. That's for liquid precipitation for this time of the year, but we'll be uh, getting ready to swap out that inner tube for snowfall. There's our snowboard, which I'll mention again in a second. There's our snow stake. Before you know it, that's going to be covered with lots of snow on the ground. And finally, our RainWise weather station here, uh, which helps us measure a variety of instruments, including probably most obviously there, you can see that anemometer spinning around. So wind speed and also direction there. So as I mentioned, here's temperature once again, 24 hour maximum minimum temperature is gathered here, including the current conditions, the current temperature at the time of the observation. And on the left hand side, you can see sort of this more beehive looking, uh, it's actually a radiation shield that helps shield the thermistor that's inside. Um, but also you can see there's lots of room for air to get through. We wanna make sure there's good ventilation. So it's painted white, uh, it's shaded, good ventilation, all what you need for accurate weather measurement, or excuse me, accurate temperature measurement that is. Next, we have our instruments for precipitation. Once again, there's the standard rain gauge. It has a nice plastic tube and funnel in there right now for this time of the year for measuring liquid precipitation or for when you take that out in the winter time and you're measuring snow in the can uh, and using the same measuring stick to measure snowfall, you can then melt all of that snowfall and measure it in that same funnel. And that gives you the liquid water equivalent from that snowfall. Uh, and there's the snow stake there once again, uh, not pictured, but was in the video briefly is a snowboard, just a flat piece of white painted plywood that helps us track uh, storm totals for the winter time. So you can kind of brush that off. It gives you another place just to verify uh, snow depth and also measurement from storms, especially if you're in a wide open field in a, in a windy location. And then lastly for the instruments, although there are, are still quite a few more that I won't cover, we have this nice RainWise MK3 sensor, uh, really nice weather station if, uh, if you're uh, a big weather fan and wanting some robust instrumentation at home. Uh, this helps us pull barometric pressure uh, from a barometer in this system, helps us get our wind gust and direction data that we report each day at 8 a.m. Uh, but it also gives us a little bit of backup verification data as well, just in case our primary instruments um, need some type of verification or double checking. Um, and not pictured here, I guess I should have taken a picture of the full crew of people who support this station, including myself. People come here every single day, uh, and as Nicole and Keith are going to touch on a little bit later, uh, having human verification and using uh, human senses just to verify what's going on, measure, uh, at least report what's happening in terms of significant uh, rain events, snow, blizzards, all that sort of stuff, and making sure that the instrumentation is working properly um, and, and uh, getting to the bottom of any er erroneous measurements or things like that. 
And just about last but not least here before I pass it along, uh, I won't get into uh, the full scope and impact of, of all this data being collected, but as I mentioned, as just one station as part of a much larger network, it helps us understand not only the local, but regional and national weather and also long-term climate. So it's, it's part of an incredibly efficient uh, and, and well-covered uh, system across this entire nation. So it's certainly a privilege for the observatory to support this national program as well. It provides that real-time real uh, verification of data for watches, warnings, advisories that go out uh, from the National Weather Service at our local reporting office in Gray, Maine. Um, but then even just more specifically, it was amazing just the other week, and I have it pictured here, the U.S. Drought Monitor map from last Thursday, uh, getting a phone call from the Farm Service Agency uh, saying, hey, you know, we need some precipitation data for your local community. Uh, we have farmers who are in uh, serious need of support because of severe drought conditions for livestock, grazing, etc. Um, and using data from this station and from many others, they're able to verify just how severe drought is uh, and ultimately provide assistance for farmers in the region. All right, so here's the last slide and I'll hand it off to Keith here. Ways to get involved, if uh, we've already sort of piqued your interest, you can become a co-op observer. It is, it's definitely a commitment, but for those of you who absolutely love weather and, and gathering data and, and wanna have some instrumentation at your home, the National Weather Service will help you get involved. Weather.gov slash co-op is where you can find more information about that program. Uh, if you're interested maybe just in measuring precipitation and maybe a little more casually, the Kokoraz program, the Community Collaborative Rain, Hail, and Snow Network at kokoraz.org is a great place to volunteer, much simpler in comparison. Uh, also, hey, check out the Mount Washington Observatory online store if you want to go buy a weather station right now because you're so excited about uh, gathering weather data at, at your home. Or for those of you who are nearby, maybe uh, within shouting distance here, uh, education at mountwashington.org if you want to reach out to volunteer at the NCON3 station or find out more about the co-op program. All right, so I will leave it there because I think you all want to hear from Keith Garrett and Nicole Tallman coming up here. So I will stop sharing my screen and I will hand things over to Keith who's going to talk about our mesonet system across the White Mountains. So take it away, Keith. Well, I get you here, just wanna do a mic check, make sure that's all working and you can hear me well. Hear you great. In fact, if you wanna pull up your presentation, I'll let you know that we can see it. All righty. And that's great. We already got a couple questions coming in. If folks have questions as they come up, don't hesitate to find the Q&A button. And Keith, I can see that just fine, which is great. Don't hesitate to use the Q&A button at the bottom uh, middle of your toolbar on Zoom if you're there. So, all right, I'll, I'll go away now. Keith, take it over. All right. Hello, everybody. My name is Keith Garrett. I am uh, Information Systems at Mount Washington Observatory. I'm in charge of maintaining and operating the mesonet as well as uh, our information technology infrastructure at Mount Washington. Uh, let's see. So we'll start with what is a mesonet? Um, the definition says a mesonet is a network of weather stations that record meteorological information on a mesoscale. It's always great when they include the word in its definition. So now we need to know what is a mesoscale? Uh, Meteorological information is measured on different scales. Uh, synoptic scale is a really wide area. Uh, a region like New England is a synoptic scale, but it's generally considered about a thousand kilometers or more. A micro scale is uh, micro, small, and it's about one kilometer or less in size. And a mesoscale is, is pretty much everything between the two. Uh, five kilometers to hundreds of kilometers across. And a, a good example of a mesonet is the Mount Washington Regional Mesonet. So we operate uh, 18 to 24 stations, depending on which ones are in operation at the time, across the White Mountain National Forest. And um, it probably covers somewhere around 200,000 acres. I'd have to have to check the area again. Um, and what it does is it provides real-time measurements from these remote weather stations and it uses a variety of equipment and communication types. 
some of the standard um, measurements that we take are temperature, relative humidity, wind speed and direction, solar radiation, ground temperature, and even snow depth at, at one of our test stations. Um, they communicate using a variety of different methods. None of them are hardwired, they're all remote, so they all use some type of microwave communication to uh, talk to the summit so that we can record the data. A typical station will consist of uh, solar panels, uh, charge controller, and large arrays of batteries. These things all have to operate 24-7 in all kinds of weather conditions. So they all have solar panels, large battery arrays, and we try to get as efficient of charge controllers as possible. A couple of our stations can only see a few hours of sunlight based on their location during the, the middle of winter. Uh, next, the pretty much the heart of our equipment network on the Mesonet, let me uh, switch to my web camera here, are Cam, uh, Campbell Scientific data loggers. And let's see if you guys can see this. So this is what a data logger looks like. This is a Campbell Scientific CR6. These things, to me, as an IT person, are fantastic. They have multiple channels that re can record all different types of data. Um, they're, they're light. They're very low power. Um, they can record data internally. They have SD card slots. They have built-in radios on different ones. They, they integrate very well with everything else that we do. Now, let me switch back to the presentation here. All right, next, for, for wind on most, most of these stations, we use RM Young wind monitors. Those are the standard propeller type anemometers, and I'd show you what they look like, uh, except for I don't have one here with me right now that um, you'll see on many weather stations across the country at airports, they're, they're durable, they, they last quite a long time and they use very, very little power. And again, everything on these stations needs to use as little power as possible. For temperature and relative humidity, we usually run two temperature sensors. We use Campbell Scientific CS215s as well as T107 temperature sensors. And we, we run two temperature sensors so that we can tell if one of them's failing. I mean, sometimes it's obvious and you see a temperature of 300 degrees coming off of the station, you know there's an issue. You can check the other sensor and if it says it's you know 45 degrees, you have to make a visit. Uh, then the, the communication side, which is usually a radio of some type and an antenna. Lots of ubiquity equipment, free wave equipment, uh, Deliveron, Trango systems, Mimosa systems. So depending on the location of the station, how far it has to transmit, what kind of power we have available to us, uh, that can determine what type of other communication equipment's on there. For, uh, let's see, lost track of myself here. So one good thing about the Mesonet is it, it covers such a large area and it, at different elevations across the White Mountains and down in the valleys that it provides an excellent location for testing many types of different instrumentation. So each of the locations are, are very different. You can, a station in Tuckerman will see a, t a great deal of snow, whereas a station at, say, 5,300 feet on the Otter Road while there's a lot of snow there, it doesn't stay around. Uh, however, at 5,300, you get the, the extreme winds and you get lots of icing. There are quite a few operational challenges with these. Uh, I'm gonna switch and play another video here. So this is uh, our 4,300 foot station. This was exposed a few days before uh, when we, went up on a winter trip to, to visit the station. And every Wednesday, the summit staff has to stop at each station on the way up the Otter Road and check it, de-ice it, and sometimes dig it out. These two are trying to get to the battery. This time the station had, uh, had failed. One of the panels had disconnected itself. Uh, so heavy icing and access to these stations are, are two of our, our big challenges. Um, with a lot of the other stations, moisture penetration from, from driving rain and 
humidity, the stations that are in the fog most of the year really can become saturated. And again, the equipment that we use is very resilient to the water penetration. Uh, wildlife can be an issue. Porcupines and, and voles actually love to eat wires. And we actually have to usually use something like WD-40 and just wipe down the wiring on the station to, to try to in, keep the, the smaller rodents from chewing on the wires. Uh, not sure why they like to do it, maybe salt from our hands. And then of course there's high winds on many of these stations and our biggest thing is power budget. Again, being a remote station, they need to run by themselves. They don't get recharged by generators. So all the equipment that we choose has to be extremely low power and be able to run 24 seven. All right, so with all these different stations, we can also log in online and view each station's data in real time. Uh, we may make that link available for you guys after the presentation. It's, it's not all that exciting. You get to see these wonderful graphs, usually in five minute intervals. Some of the stations are one minute inter interval, uh, but that's one of the methods we use for, for uh, monitoring the health of the individual stations. Our primary section of the mesonet is called the Outer Road Vertical Profile. Most of you that are, that are watching tonight are probably familiar with our current summit conditions page. The data and the temperature profile you see on current summit conditions comes from the Outer Road Vertical Profile. You'll notice hey, that- Sorry yeah. to interrupt. Can you swap over back to your PowerPoint? Oh, I did. I knew that was going to happen. Yeah, we see, we see Adam just digging and digging. And there we go. Let nice. me just so see, see if I- I don't think you guys didn't really miss much on that on that previous slide anyway. So the auto road vertical profile, um, again, is what you'll see if you visit our current summit conditions page on our website. And it's a sequence of stations that start at the auto road base and go up the auto road about every 1000 feet. Uh, this is great for for our own usage when we're trying to travel up and down the mountain especially in the winter, uh, for the auto road, for the cog railway, for the state parks. Each of these organizations that, that use it uh, really rely upon the data. So they can tell, is it freezing at 4,000 feet? Can we go above there safely? Can people traverse the auto road safely? Uh, about 10 to 15,000 people a day view the auto road vertical profile. Uh, as I was mentioning, it's important for recreational safety in the White Mountains. Uh, it's used to determine whether they open different routes to the summit, such as Tuckerman Ravine. And it acts as a permanent weather balloon. Uh, it's, it's always on. You can see temperature inversions across the White Mountains, and all of the information is assimilated actually every 15 minutes by the National Weather Service. It says an hour, but it's every 15 minutes. Uh, and again, it's extremely important for our operations, especially when we're, when we're doing shift change and sending people up and down the mountain. Uh, just to touch on some more of the equipment side, uh, with the network of stations, it also gives us the ability to um, not offer, but we have available to us high-speed internet across most of the White Mountains. So generally anywhere where we can see the summit from or Wildcat or Cannon, we can, we can deploy a weather station that can transmit to us in real time. And amongst some of the communication services that run over this network are, are phones and uh, our network of webcams. Transition to that. So uh, across many of these mesonet stations, we have a series of access cameras. Uh, some of them are fixed, some of them are wide angle, um, some of them are pan tilt zoom. And what you're seeing right now is an example of our camera on Wildcat. And it's able to zoom right into Tuckerman Ravine or Huntington or right up to the summit, if you can see through the clouds. And 
these Zoom views are available to the members in our member section of the website, and some of the standard views are available to the general public uh, also on our website. Transition back here. All right, and a few other things we do with the data. Um, if you have an Amazon Alexa or an Echo, you can add the Mount Washington skill. Uh, you can ask it, what is the weather on the summit of Mount Washington? Say, Alexa, ask Mount Washington, what is the weather? Or Alexa, ask Mount Washington, what is the forecast? And it will read you the higher summits forecast. Uh, soon we'll have the ability so that you can say, Alexa, ask Mount Washington, what is the weather on Wildcat? And it will tell you what the weather is at our station on Wildcat or Hermit Lake or Lake in the Clouds. And that is everything I have. Feel free to ask a bunch of questions in the comments. Um, and now I will send it up to the summit. All right, thank you, Keith. Um, I am Nicole Tallman. I am a weather observer and education specialist at the summit of Mount Washington. And I will be talking a little bit about the instrumentation from the summit's side of things. Um, so we'll jump right in. Now up on the summit, we obviously have a lot of weather going on and we can measure a lot, but we have to select certain variables. Um, and some of the weather instruments depend on what variables we need to be reporting out. So one of the main things that we do, we report all of our information out through METARS every single hour. Uh, METAR is going to be basically the communication between meteorologists and let's say uh, pilots or anybody that's higher up in the atmosphere wants to know what's going on up there. We go outside and we take our weather observations um, and we need to hit on all of those data points that METAR reports out. Uh, we also report out our information to the National Weather Service. So depending on what they are asking of us will also depend on what instruments we have on the summit. We also are a uh, research facility as well as an observatory. So based on our research projects that are going on right now, we will have certain instruments on the summit. Uh, we also need to select our instruments and select our variables that we measure based on what will survive on Mount Washington. Um, also what's accurate, precise, reliable, again, what can survive our extreme conditions. Um, and they need to also be repairable because Mount Washington is a very extreme environment. So we need to be able to have our instruments repairable and uh, durable enough to survive. All right, so this is just a brief rundown of some of our instruments. Uh, so during a weather observation, you're going to be taking many different readings from a variety of instruments. So we're taking readings of temperature, dew point, relative humidity. We use what's called a sling psychrometer for that. Just so you know, I will be diving in deeper onto some of these instruments. This is just a brief run through. Uh, we also are looking at wind speed and direction from our anemometers, air pressure from our barometers, and then precipitation from our precipitation cans. So I'm going to talk first about one of our instruments that we use every single observation when we go outside. Uh, just a brief rundown. Uh, our observations are 365 days a year, 24-7. We do them hourly. So every hour we're going outside and we're using some of these instruments here. This one is what's called a sling psychrometer. Um, and so if you've been on the summit of Mount Washington and you happen to be up there when we are taking an observation outside, you see us walking around and slinging this device. Uh, this device here has a set of thermometers on it. So let me walk up to the camera here. Uh, you see that there is just a regular dry bulb temperature and also a wet bulb temperature. This wet bulb thermometer is going to have a sock on the bottom that we saturate with water. And as we sling our sling psychrometer, we're going to be inducing evaporation. So we're causing this little sock here to evaporate. And evaporation is a cooling process. So we're going to get a little bit of a warmer temperature and a cooler temperature. And based on the difference between these two, we can figure out our relative humidity and also the dew point. Uh, so this is one of our instruments that we do use for every observation, as long as we're not in the fog, because when we are in the fog, uh, we are reading 100% relative humidity. So we can get our temperature not from a sling psychrometer. 
All right, another uh, thermometer that we do check out, this is for our synoptic observations, which are going to be our every six hour observations, which look more at like the trends that are going on. So with these two thermometers, we're looking at our trends of maximum temperature and minimum temperature. Uh, we're going to have a set of one alcohol filled thermometer that allows us to read a minimum temperature. So it kind of flows around the little barbell that is inside the thermometer and allows the barbell to go down and the alcohol to expand around it. Uh, and then we have our mercury filled maximum thermometer, which again will record the maximum temperature at a six hour period. Every six hours, we're also looking at precipitation and we do have our precipitation can. Uh, this precipitation can is out far enough to where buildings won't influence it and uh, precipitation can fall right into the can and again, not be influenced by uh, buildings or other structures. I do have an example of this can here. It's about the size of me. Uh, so this is one of our cans. We keep a dry can inside it every six hours. We go out and we do what this uh, picture is showing. We swap out our cans and we bring this can back into the room that I'm in right now. And we are able to measure our six hour precipitation uh, accumulation. Uh, so pouring this into a smaller tube, kind of how you saw in the co-op station with Brian, uh, and then measuring that with our precipitation measuring gauge. Move this out of the way a little bit. All right, so precipitation is obviously very important even when we are receiving a lot of precipitation. Uh, so this video here, I will go full screen and let you guys watch that without me interrupting you, but I do want to explain it first. It is going to show one of our observers going out our front door after there was a large precipitation event, and you can just see uh, some of the challenges that we face uh, going out and collecting that precipitation. Full screen. I believe the video just paused itself. Yeah, unfortunately it did pause, Nicole. That's too bad. All right. I will just play that right back. All right. There you Is go. Playing there? Okay, perfect. <laughs> So as you can see here, they're going to start to shovel this out um, and we are going to have to walk out of this door, go uh, a little while away from the building. Again, you don't want the building to be impacting our measurements. Uh, so this can be a challenge come winter time when we do have snow drifts and snow accumulation or high winds. Uh, once you get past this building here, you are exposed to the elements. So I won't play the whole video here, but I do, uh, did want to mention that collecting our precipitation can sometimes be a challenge in itself. All right, moving on to our next instrument. Uh, this is going to be one of our anemometers that we do have on the summit. So this here is an RM Young anemometer and Keith did mention uh, that we do have RM Youngs also in our mesonets. We do have one on the summit of Mount Washington as well. So this anemometer is going to be a propeller anemometer. So it is going to be measuring wind speeds with this moving part of a propeller. Uh, it is very good at picking up fluctuations in low wind speeds. And we actually do have this RM Young coated with a hydrophobic coating, which helps somewhat uh, come rain and that any kind of uh, liquid precipitation event. But unfortunately, this RM Young and this anemometer is not heated, which makes it a little difficult to um, read accurately once the freezing fog sets in and there's ice. Uh, another contributing factor to why we wouldn't leave this anemometer up during icing events would be that you don't want ice to get into any kind of moving parts. Um, so our RM Young, again, we have it up when it's clear and it's very good at collecting those small fluctuations in the winds. And we also do have our pitot tube anemometer, uh, which you can see it does not have moving parts and it actually is heated. So it's a, a little bit uh, more durable of an instrument for our winter weather months, which occur quite frequently on Mount Washington. 
So our pitot tube is going to measure differential pressure, and that's how we get our wind speeds from the pitot tube. Uh, pitot tubes, you may have seen them being used on airplanes. Uh, we actually have our own version of the pitot tube. So I'll explain a little bit on how this works. There's a opening in the front of the pitot tube where air is going to come in, and that is going to be our total pressure. There's also these little tiny openings on the side, uh, which have air moving in the column as our static pressure. And so there's going to be a difference between total pressure and static pressure. And these two little wires here are going to have those two pressures come down in through 75 feet of tubing from the top of the tower all the way down into this weather room here. Um, as that information comes down, it is then going to go to two pressure transducers and figure out the difference of those two pressures. Um, and then we use that difference in inches of water of the two different pressures and put it into Bernoulli's principle along with relative humidity, temperature, and pressure, and you can get an accurate wind speed that way. Uh, so again, the pitot tube is very good at reading um, our wind speeds in the wintertime because it is heated. Uh, it actually runs with 1,400 watts of power and it is going to heat itself with basically uh, the equivalent of running a microwave 24-7, a microwave oven. Uh, so this pitot tube here, again, 1,400 watts, uh, and it is going to be the best at capturing fluctuations in uh, 20 miles per hour or more. So it is good for capturing those higher wind speed fluctuations. Uh, and then the information from this pitot tube get set down here and uh, based on the difference of pressure, we're going to have a little needle move on our haze chart and give us this chart of 24 hour wind speeds. So I have this one here that I can bring and explain a little bit closer. So the haze chart, how it reads is the further out from the center here, the higher the wind speeds are going to be. And the more it's jumping up and down, the means it's fluctuating more, so it's more gusty. Uh, so you have some examples behind me as well. You can see that as it's further out from the center, that's going to be our higher wind speeds uh, fluctuating there. So the haze chart is going to rotate on its axis, and this little pen is going to bounce around depending on uh, that differential pressure from the pitot tube. So we have this chart uh, for our wind speeds dating back very far, and I personally love standing back and watching the haze chart kind of bounce around. I can actually give you a little quick look. We go full. Uh, wide view, you can see that our haze chart is in operation actually right here behind me as I'm doing this presentation. All right, the next thing I want to talk about is our next gen pitot. Uh, so our next gen pitot has the same basic concept as the pitot that I had just explained. Uh, the shape is, the shape and aerodynamics are an airfoil shape from General Electric. So uh, GE actually has helped us a lot with this pitot. Um, so the amount of energy that goes into this pitot is going to be about three microwaves 24-7. So it is about 3,800 watts to be running uh, the heat into this pitot that is going to heat it and hopefully de-ice it to keep it ice-free. So that is one of the main goals uh, of our instruments is to have them operating accurately, even in our extreme conditions, even when we are icing over. So uh, one of the advancements of the next gen pitot was to keep it quite warm so that it wouldn't clog up and be prone to um, having clog like ice clogs in it. Uh, so that means that there will be a more continuous stream of weather data coming in, as opposed to maybe the older generation of the pitot that is not heated as highly as this one. Um, there are also one of the other differences is that I mentioned that there was 75 feet of tubing in our original or in our older version of the pitot. This one has about six inches of tubing and both of the pressure trans transducers are actually located within the fin. Um, we theorize that the shorter tubing is going to be able to capture fluctuations at a higher resolution. All right, moving on to our barograph. So our barograph is again something that is right behind me. You may have seen it actually right below with the uh, haze chart behind me. So this is going to be measuring uh, four days worth of pressure trends on a sheet of paper. I can bring one close to you. So it's going to show us as we get higher pressures and then maybe falling down into lower pressure. Um, 
which is important to know whether we're going to be expecting maybe some low pressure with storms or higher pressure, fairer weather. Um, just looking at pressure trends is definitely very important. We also have our uh, digital barometer, which is sent to us by the National Weather Service. That is what they use for their um, gold instrument or their primary instrument for pressure. Uh, this pressure here is going to be what we're reading out on the summit, and then the altimeter setting would be if we took our pressure, brought it to sea level, what it would be equivalent to down at sea level. Uh, now to my trivia question, our oldest instrument that is in use on the summit still is going to be our mercury barometer. So our mercury barometer was gifted to us from Blue Hill Observatory. Uh, where it was originally in use from 1888 and I believe that it was brought to Mount Washington around our opening uh, around 1932 maybe to the 40s. Um, so this is our oldest instrument still in date. Uh, we use this to get our baseline readings for the uh, barometer that I just showed you right here. So every four days or so we're going to be using our mercury barometer to get a very accurate reading of our pressure to then start these uh, pressure trend graphs. So another instrument per se is going to be our human senses. So it is very important. Mount Washington is a manual weather station and we definitely find the importance in having those human senses as an instrument on the summit of Mount Washington. Uh, just briefly, some of the things that humans are going to pick up on that maybe instruments would have a tough time doing on the summit of Mount Washington would be looking at certain visibilities, uh, sky conditions, making sure those readings that we're getting outside are as accurate as possible and that there aren't outliers. Uh, we're able to do that right on the spot. Determining precipitation types. So going outside and seeing if it's snow pellets versus snow grains or snowflakes uh, versus ice pellets. Some of those might be pretty difficult to do with a sensor on Mount Washington, but the human senses are a valid uh, instrument on Mount Washington. Then also just the general verification of our information that we're sending out. So I just mentioned precipitation type. Uh, we use a snowboard going outside when we think that precipitation, it may be changing its uh, type or intensity. And so we bring this felt covered board outside and let it kind of gather the precipitation on it you can quickly tell whether there's dendritic snowflakes or maybe just uh, some pillars or if it's just raining, you can tell whether a uh, little pellet is opaque or trans uh, transparent. So snowboards are important for determining our precipitation type, especially in winter precipitation. They also make for great pictures if you can manage to get a snowflake. We also report uh, significant cloud types on Mount Washington. So looking out into the sky, maybe a salometer that measures cloud heights, won't be able to tell whether it's looking at a cumulus cloud or in this case, a lenticular cloud. So being able to tell certain cloud types in the atmosphere can give us kind of a insight of what is happening in the atmosphere. So going outside, seeing a lenticular like this, we are able as humans to bring that information inside and report out that at this level, we are seeing a lenticular cloud, uh, or at this level, maybe we're seeing a cumulonimbus cloud, which is a thunderstorm. So it's very important for us to uh, not only look at cloud heights and cloud amount, but also cloud types. Also some varying visibility. So it is very frequent on Mount Washington that we go into the fog. And occasionally, we are half in the fog and half in bright blue sky. So it is important, again, for the human senses to go outside and be able to determine uh, what the prevailing visibility is, if there's any varying visibility during the observation, uh, whether we're going from blue sky to about a, a, a fourth of a mile visibility. Uh, so that is something that humans are able to do on the dot when we go outside for our hourly observations. We can also determine whether there's precipitation in the area or not. So in this picture, maybe a little difficult, I'll go full screen for this one. Uh, you can see that there are some showers in the vicinity even and then maybe in the distance. Uh, so we can determine whether precipitation is within five miles of our, our uh, station or if it's between five and ten or past ten miles. And we actually report that differently in our observations uh, for our METAR observations uh, that get sent out to 
maybe pilots that are going to be going through the area. Uh, it's also very important that we have humans on the summit as a quote unquote instrument to maintain our other instruments. So de-icing is a very common occurrence come the winter months or even throughout the year when we get our occasional icing, even in the summer and fall months. Uh, so ice will accumulate on every surface, even yourself when you're out there de-icing and it covers all of our instruments. Um, sometimes we have to go out four or five times an hour when our icing is at its most extreme. And we are making sure that those instruments are free to read uh, accurately and maybe sway in the wind as we have our wind vane over here. We're just making sure that all of our instruments are able to perform at their highest ability. We also have plenty of other instruments that I am not able to talk about just because of time constraint. Uh, I'll mention a few of them that we use. We use a EFM, which is our electric field meter. It uh, helps us determine whether it is safe to go outside or not when there is lightning in the area. We also use things like radar. Uh, we, there's radar at the National Weather Service Gray that we use uh, quite frequently to determine if precipitation is moving our way or in the area as well. All right, and where does our information go? We could actually have a whole nother Science in the Mountains talk about where our information goes. So this is the most brief uh, mention of where it goes. We go to, our information goes to businesses. So as I've mentioned, we send our information out to the National Weather Service. Some local businesses in the area will also depend on us uh, for safety reasons. So we have the Mount Washington Auto Road and the Mount Washington Cog Railway. Our information also goes out to the NCEI or the National Center for Environmental Information. Um, all of our climate data is going out there to get um, analyzed and researched. We also have research going on internally and again externally. And recreation, a lot of people uh, come to Mount Washington for recreation purposes. So having um, a constant stream of information coming from Mount Washington is definitely important in that sense. And again, many, many more outlets uh, receive our information and utilize that. Again, we can talk about this forever, but I will leave it as that. And if finally you want more information about anything that we have talked about, feel free to reach out to Brian Fitzgerald at his email here and Keith Garrett at his email here. And that is the end of my presentation. So I'll throw it back to all of us for our Q&A portion of this. All right, thank you so much, Nicole. And thanks Keith as well for presenting. Yeah, you're not going anywhere just yet, Nicole, because we have lots of questions coming in here. Uh, quite a few have been poking through what's coming so far. Uh, so if you haven't gotten your questions in just yet, now's the time to do so. So make sure you go down to the bottom middle of your taskbar on the Zoom screen and enter a question. Um, and I think we have full permission here, Nicole and Keith, to kind of nerd out because we have some very technical questions. We also have some uh, some more general and some some basic questions, some info we definitely missed through our program. So apologies there if uh, we glazed over a few things, especially for those not as familiar with our work. Um, so we'll go ahead and we'll we'll get cracking here. So a lot of questions. Uh, maybe we'll kick it off with this one first. Where did it go? Oh, there's a good question about about backgrounds. Where did it go now? Oh, I'm so sorry. I wanted to give this person uh, their their due here. Uh, somebody had asked uh, a little bit about uh, background and training. Uh, for each one of us. Cliff Bryant, there we go. Cliff, thank you so much for your question. Uh, Nicole and Keith, uh, do you want to share a little bit about your uh, your backgrounds and training that have sort of brought you to your positions at this point in time? I don't know if, Nicole, you want to start first? Yeah, sure, I could start first. Uh, so I went to Rutgers University with my, and I got a degree in meteorology. So that kind of kick-started uh, my career, you could say, in meteorology. Uh, I then came to Mount Washington Observatory as an intern uh, and then came back full time back in June of this year. Uh, in order to be a weather observer, I had to go through the METAR certification and I passed that um, a few months after being hired here. So that was definitely a rigorous uh, study and quizzing myself on just the terminology of METAR. So and for those of you that don't know anything about METAR, METAR is going to be a a coded um, language per se that 
you send out your information, all of your uh, meteorology observation information with that. So I had to basically learn that coded language and pass a, a standardized test for that. And now I am a certified observer for the Mount Washington Observatory. Awesome. Thanks, Nicole. Keith, what about you? What's your background? So I have been doing IT, and I just did the math, for 25 years, which does not seem right. Uh, however, I started in 1995 uh, working for a computer store, eventually went out, opened my own computer store. And for, for most of that 25 years, I supported businesses and towns and schools and hospitals and medical facilities doing all types of information technology. Uh, when this opportunity came up to work with weather instrumentation, it, uh, my brother and my sister-in-law are both very involved in weather. Uh, my brother is at NOAA Center for Satellite Applications and Research, and my sister-in-law is with the National Weather Service. Uh, they said I would be insane to not work for Mount Washington. So I made the transition, and now not only do I get to do the standard IT stuff, I get to play with lasers. I get to play with radar devices. I get to program data loggers and MySQL, build websites, all kinds of different programming languages. Um, and it's just such a, a, a diverse technologically based organization that it's just, it's fantastic. You know, one, one week it's writing something for an Arduino micro weather station to deploy out in Tuckerman. The next it's somebody sends me, this might answer somebody's question on is the radiation shield for your min max thermometer aspirated? You know, some, somebody will send me something like this, which is a naturally aspirated uh, radiation shield. So, you know, it's, it, it's just a, it's a great place, and uh, I hope that answers the question. I was starting to, to babble a little bit. <laughs> All right, Keith, you're, we're going to have lots of questions come your way here. Cause, uh, <laughs> as you can tell, uh, Keith, our resident nerd among nerds, so um, we're excited to throw some questions his way. Um, and just quickly, I mean, similar to Nicole, my experience, uh, well, actually not a degree in meteorology. My, my background's broadly environmental science, but also a weather observer at Mount Washington, a weather observer at Blue Hill Observatory. And uh, over time, it, you certainly get to know instruments really well, uh, regardless of your, you know, your proclivity toward uh, technology or math or, or engineering or those sorts of things that just inherently become so fascinating, especially uh, at a place like this that have, uses so many different types uh, of technology and certainly um, both the simple and the, the old school, we'll say, um, and also the very high tech stuff. Um, and speaking of the high tech stuff, Keith, I'm going to throw it right back your way because Doug Hahn is just going to get right into it because he wants to, he wants to know, have we tested any of the new forward scattering sensors like the Weissla FD70 series for visibility, precipitation ID, or even precipitation amounts? And I know we've tested uh, Weissla uh, visibility sensors with the FAA and thick fog and those sorts of things. But what about this one he's talking about in particular? I think he's probably talking about, I'm not familiar with that model, but I believe we tested a WS100 last year, which used some type of radar backscatter for measuring precipitation type, right? And that's about the best answer I can give on that one. Well, Doug, you have uh, Keith's email address behind Nicole there. So please reach out if, uh, if you want to connect. I would love to test one, send one. <laughs> All right, here's one that I'll, I'll take for the team. Uh, Anonymous wants to know, does NCON 3 also use a Davis station? Why, yes, it does. We have a Davis station as well. I guess we'll call that our uh, tertiary instrument. We have it located, actually connected to the Weather Discovery Center where I'm beaming in from today. So we have all sorts of instruments galore. Davis makes a fantastic uh, home weather station as well. Top of the line right there with RainWise too. My family has one. <laughs> All right, let's see what else. Sir William would like to know, what would you suggest to somebody who is interested in pursuing a career in meteorology? Uh, Nicole, I know you were just giving a program on this just yesterday for our virtual classroom. What would you suggest? Yes, so uh, as far as, let's say, school subjects go, uh, it is important to study hard in science, math, as well as English. Um, and if you can get into computer science, get into computer science as well. 
Um, I did not have computer science experience until college and realized that that can be a pretty heavy area of meteorology depending on the route that you go. Science and math are definitely very important. Um, and as far as, let's say, the English goes, I mean, as a scientist, a lot of people think that they don't need to also focus in English, but being able to communicate your science is a very, very important thing, not just in meteorology, but in all uh, science areas. So I definitely stress that as well as being able to communicate um, any research that you're doing or even just the science that you're a part of. Thanks, Nicole. Mm -hmm. um, back to Keith for a second here. A uh, couple questions about solar panels keeping those clear to maintain for the mesonet sites. Uh, both John Ritz wants to know, specifically, have we considered maybe small wind turbines instead of or supplementing our solar panels? Uh, and Richard Clapp wants to know how we actually keep them clear throughout the year. Well, keeping them clear, uh, a good portion of them are wind scoured regularly. The ones that develop a layer of ice have to be manually cleared. So we have lots of people in the area, volunteers, that when they pass a station and see the panels iced over, they will clear it. Uh, as far as the outer road vertical profile goes, that is one of the regular duties on shift change days. And whenever the snowcat goes up and down the road, they stop at the stations, they check them, and they clear them. Um, as far as using an alternative type of power other than solar, it would be very entertaining to put a wind turbine on there. However, it would undergo a rapid unscheduled disassembly, as Elon Musk likes to say. It would not last. You know, a couple of the stations regularly see winds over 100 miles an hour, and it would be great to have a camera on it, but they, they would not survive. <laughs> Lots of limitations there for our Mesonet. Keith has his hands full, making sure that uh, the mesonet stations that we do have stay in place and intact, that's for sure. And speaking of which, uh, Desiree Gold asks, how are the remote weather stations anchored to the ground given the wind and ice issues they encounter, Keith? They are actually either directly mounted into the bedrock, uh, bolted down, or on several of the stations, we have very large concrete blocks that they are anchored into. So they are, they're very firmly secured, yet, however, we do find that some of them will shift. Uh, with a heavy snowpack, uh, we'll have the ones that are mounted to concrete shift a little bit, and we've actually had some just fold right over from snow load, even when they're bolted right to the bedrock. Challenges. It uh, doesn't matter how strong that rock is, I guess. As long as you have things sticking out into the wind, uh, they are at the wind's mercy. Um, got a question here from John B, who asks a, a tough one that I think I had to uh, mull over for a little while while we're sitting here. Um, do you supply data to the NOAA Mountain Point forecast? If so, why are only two peaks listed in the White Mountains versus multiple peaks from the Green Mountains and the Adirondacks? Well, I think what John's referencing is um, one of the recreation forecast products that the National Weather Service uh, and their regional offices um, provide. Uh, for those familiar with the observatory, we do produce a higher summits forecast that is used by recreationalists, as Nicole mentioned before. Uh, the National Weather Service product here that I think John's referring to uh, is verified, I believe, by Mount Washington Observatory data uh, to help them with their forecasting, since I believe it is uh, not only a sort of a, a grid point forecast, similar to the uh, forecast you'd get if you went to weather.gov for any of us, um, but uh, it is verified by data collected uh, at the very few sites that do exist uh, above treeline Mount Washington Observatory, certainly being one of the very few in this area. As to why there's so few point forecasts, I don't know. There's uh, certainly a lot of variability between the Burlington office in Vermont that have a number of peaks there and Gray, Maine, which has to take care of uh, recreational forecasts for lakes, rivers, the ocean, and many mountain peaks scattered across a pretty wide region. So. Um, great question there from John. Um, someone uh, anonymous asked the question, Keith, where are the 18 weather stations of the White Mountains? I know uh, you had shown at least uh, oh, a good handful of them on Mount Washington and the nearby peak of uh, Wildcat, but what about the rest of them? They are ranging from Conway to Cannon to um, back down to Atitash to Wildcat. If you go on our website and you look for uh, Mount Washington Regional Mesonet, you will find a map 
the the maps outdated we're in the process of building a new website but the the locations for those stations are roughly accurate to give you a, a feel for the area covered by the stations awesome yes yeah, certainly i encourage you, you all to check out the website just to see that nice visual you can scan around and see all the sites and the data in real time when available so uh keith and uh his his uh colleague pete gagne as well uh, usually busy takes full days or, or more to just to get to sites and get the work done they need to since it's across such a large area uh zachary asks point blank can we get the data from you guys uh yes zachary contact one of our email addresses there if you have something in particular you're looking for especially historic data um, which we have troves of uh, for real-time stuff mountwashington.org you can find current summit conditions our mesonet page as uh, Keith just referenced. Uh, and in fact, we actually added the NCON 3 co-op station too. So you can see data from our Rainwise station there as well. Uh, let's see. Um, Keith Miho asks, will heat from traffic or the cars along the auto road and the Mesonet stations there affect the reading of observation stations there? No. Too far away, inverse square law, too much wind. Um, I don't think any of them are, cl I don't know if you could get a vehicle any closer than maybe 10 meters to a station. So, uh, and it would be driving by. That's good. Thankfully there isn't too much traffic, uh, for those of you who've been in the auto road, unless maybe you're caught up, caught behind someone who's a little, a little nervous on the road. Um, here's a question, Nicole, what happens if it's not safe to go outside at the hourly reporting time and, you know, what instruments are, are we using perhaps instead? Yes, yeah, so there are instances where it is unsafe to go outside during your hourly observation. Um, first thing that comes to mind would be thunderstorms. You do not want to put yourself at risk being on the highest summit with many metal towers on our summit. So uh, in that case, we would try to get as much information as we can from any vantage points inside. And we would, instead of going outside to get our, uh, our temperature, we do have um, some, I guess, secondary temperature instruments um, that are getting readings that we could rely on in a case where we cannot go outside. I believe, Keith, correct me if I'm wrong, Campbell Scientific. Um, but yes, uh, we definitely do have some times where you don't go outside for your observation. As far as, uh, let's say, high winds or precipitation, you could typically find a place outside that is shielded uh, to an extent from the winds or precipitation to get as much information as you can and then bring that inside. Um, but then again, have those secondary instruments to rely on for any information that you can't get. Yeah, excellent. It's, uh, you're, you're all used to going out in some pretty tough conditions, but certainly there, there are some lines that won't be crossed for, for safety on the summit. Um, let's see, quickly, as we're, we're running out of time here, definitely want to try and get to as many as possible. Rob Sahora asks, do you use weather balloons or rockets to get upper atmosphere readings, which is a, a great question I'll take a stab at. Um, we, have, we don't typically launch weather balloons ourselves unless there are specific research projects uh, associated with that. What's nice and what Keith has been referencing is we have uh, not only at 6,288 feet are we this highest point in the Northeast and essentially acting like a fixed weather balloon. So we have this real-time data at this level in the atmosphere that is otherwise not uh, reliably recorded around the clock. We also have the auto road vertical temperature profile, which Keith was showing in one of his images there. So um, we are actually able to show around the clock, uh, essentially the same sort of profile that a weather balloon might, just not going much higher than that, um, which is also still important to get data from. But I will say helium is a little expensive um, so even the National Weather Service, um, they're pretty frugal about how many weather balloon launches that they do. So great question. Uh, Kenneth Binks asks, and Keith, I'm sure you'll be excited to talk about this one. Is it true that the equipment on Mount Everest that was recently tested there, uh, was it tested on Mount Washington by the OBS? Oh, I actually spent the last minute queuing up some pictures here just for that question. Because oh, I was good. hoping you would bring that one up. That would be good. So I don't know if you guys can see that one. That's coming up fine. That is an actual picture of Baker Perry, who led the Everest expedition to install mesonet stations on top of Mount Everest. Um, on Mount Washington, we, we spent a couple days with Campbell Scientific and the Everest expedition team. And while most of the equipment that they deployed on Everest 
uh, has been used at Mount Washington. The, their, their involvement with, with us wasn't for testing. We, we've run most of that stuff for, for quite a while. The, their trip to Mount Washington was more to practice installing the equipment in harsh conditions without actually having to go up Everest to uh, see how it goes together, to see what tools they needed to bring. Uh, and that particular picture, Baker, is all suited up wearing gloves, you know, trying to see if they can use the screwdriver, how do the cables attach, what, what kind of plugs do they need to fit on, and how strong is the station. So it was quite an interesting time, and it was uh, a pretty cold day that day. Let's see if I got this one too. Um, that one's a, a selfie <laughs> with ice beard, and that's the Everest crew in the reflection in the goggles. So anyway, yes, they, they did come up. It was, a, it was a great time, and I believe they've been getting some invaluable information from the top of Everest. That's great. Thanks for sharing those visuals, Keith, so quickly. Uh, Anonymous asks, does MWO have any content, uh, conventional ASOS units? That means automated surface observing uh, station. What is feeding KMWN? That's our station identifier. And where is it? Well, real quick, it's the summit of Mount Washington. It's what Mount Washington Observatory and the weather station uh, is reporting from. Uh, every single hour of the day. It's what Nicole and her colleagues are um, providing data from. And no, there is no automated station there. Thank goodness we have Nicole. We have uh, her five other coworkers who work around the clock on the summit. Uh, so we're unique in, uh, in many ways and certainly one of them being around the clock manual weather observations, certainly uh, legacy there for sure. Uh, another anonymous asks, uh, Nicole, which National Weather Service station do we send our data to? Uh, Portland, or sorry, Gray, Maine. Gray, Maine, yeah, exactly. That's the regional one. And another anonymous asking, sorry to put you on the spot like that. Uh, <laughs> how much time does an education specialist, which is your role, Nicole, spend on that function versus being a weather observer? Good question. Uh, it really depends on the week and how many education programs I have upcoming. So this week I had about three programs and every day spent at least a few hours uh, preparing for those programs, kind of gathering information for what you see behind me um, and just making sure that I am as prepared as I can be to be the best education specialist. Um, as far as observing goes, I am splitting my observation time uh, for our 12 hour day shift with my fellow daytime observer. So I'm doing six hourly observations a day, uh, which typically can take about I'd say about 20 minutes uh, per observation, and you are also preparing yourself to go outside and have the most accurate information. So the ob itself might take about 20 minutes, but um, you can prepare for that about 30 minutes out of the hour. So there's a balance. Uh, again, it depends on the week, whether I am more of an observer or more of an education specialist. Yes, thankfully, Nicole does have a good amount of help on the mountain as well, but uh, still uh, all of them wearing quite a few hats up there, not just education, but um, engineering backgrounds, data science, meteorology, all those sorts of things. Uh, sorry to say it, but I think this may be our last question for the evening. I'm sorry, there are so many great questions here. Apologies if we didn't get to it tonight. Uh, this one will go last to Lawrence and Keith, perhaps you can talk about this one. Your station has the highest wind speed measurement in the USA, can you talk about the accuracy of your wind equipment, i.e. the rugged, ruggedization sensors and the general accuracy of them? It's a tough one. Um, I believe NWS standards are accurate to within either 5% or 10%. So it's a pretty broad window as far as reporting standards. However, my goal, and I think all of our goal is to be within a few miles an hour. Um, for example, during our, our 171 mile an hour event last 2018, uh, we had two anemometers running. One recorded 171.25, and I believe the other was 171.75. So that's two different anemometers in the same location on the parapet. And they were literally a half a mile an hour apart at 100. 70 plus or minus miles an hour. Uh, one of the things we do to try to maintain the reliability of them is we, we regularly send them out to be calibrated. Uh, right now, the GE PETA, which you heard so much about, uh, I'm not gonna get it out, but it's on my workbench here. But here's an example of one of the pressure transducers in it. 
that this the sensor that actually measures the wind speed uh, off the pitot tube. And the reason I have this here is this one is a brand new one, straight from the factory, freshly calibrated. The two from the GE Pito have been sent back for testing and to be recertified. And we expect them to be back soon uh, and with a nice, fresh certificate of calibration. Excellent. Yeah, we could talk well, anemometers. That answers the question. Yeah, it does. We can talk anemometers all I, day long, I, I, any one of us. Uh, <laughs> We also, yeah, we have many opinions on the matter. So thank you. Thank you for that question, Lawrence. Thank you everyone for uh, your questions this evening. Uh, we should have done it again. Should have left more time for questions because these are fantastic. Um, certainly really appreciate everyone uh, joining us this evening and for, for participating where they can. Um, Hey, if you enjoyed, if you really enjoyed tonight's program, which I hope you did, please become, uh, consider becoming a member of the observatory if you aren't one already. And you can donate to help support programs like these at mountwashington.org. Uh, don't forget, though, while you're there, you can sign up for our next Science in the Mountains program, which is Tuesday, November 10th at 7 p.m. We are going to be hearing from Dr. Elizabeth Burakowski from the University of New Hampshire, and she'll be discussing the impacts on climate change on ecosystems and our society in a program that uh, she calls Winter Weather in a Warming World. So don't forget to register there, mountwashington.org slash SITM and check out our other upcoming programs or programs you missed previously. And we'll see you again real soon. Thanks everyone for joining. Have a great night. Thank you, Nicole. Thank you, Keith. Take care guys. Thank you. Good night. <laughs>